For most people, Las Vegas is a neon-lit oasis. It's where they go to escape from their day-to-day -day lives, to gamble in world-class casinos, to eat meals prepared by celebrity chefs, or to enjoy performances from the biggest names in entertainment. But if you scratch the surface just a little bit, you'll find the stories that never made it onto the postcards. The stories that remain hidden behind all the glitz and glamour of the Vegas Strip. Coming soon, it's the podcast that goes in-depth on the darker side of Vegas history. Sin City Stories, Vegas True Crime. From murder, to robbery, to arson, to bombings, we'll take you far behind the headlines of the tales you're familiar with and bring you the never-before-heard stories that helped to shape the city of Las Vegas. Sin City Stories, Vegas True Crime. The sordid tales behind the stranger-than-fiction history of fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. Coming January 1st, 2024. Get more info now at SinCityStoriesPod.com and follow Sin City Stories on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. You're listening to True Crime Feed. Welcome to True Crime Feed. I'm your host, Angela Ferrari, reviewing the best true crime podcast from the past decade with a teensy bit of humor, plus my top three true crime picks of the week. Today on the docket, we have part two in our series on Joe Lowe, aka the Asian Great Gatsby. If you haven't tuned into part one yet, pause this episode immediately and listen to that one first, or you will be more confused than me when I saw that low-rise jeans are back in style. Like, why? I thought we joined together as a species to put a stop to those wearable torture devices once and for all. Whoever designed low-rise jeans must have never sat down in a public place before. Especially not a swivel bar stool in a crowded restaurant exposing their entire upper gluteus crease for all to see. The inventor of low-rise jeans should get their own true crime episode, and no, I am not kidding. But alas, we'll save that one for another time, because today we need to finish our takedown of Joe Lowe. And as per usual, to take your listening experience to the next level, go to the truecrimefeed.com and sign up for my newsletter, where I curate visual aids to accompany the show. We've got yacht loads of photos of Joey palling around with A-list celebrities and even a former U.S. president. Alrighty then, you will remember last episode we learned about Joe Lowe's early years in Penang, Malaysia. His time at boarding school in London, where he rubbed shoulders with some of the world's wealthiest teens. Then he was off to the Wharton School of Business in Philadelphia, where he took a semester off to travel to the Middle East and learn about sovereign wealth funds. Then finally, we heard about the birth of Malaysia's sovereign wealth fund, 1MDB, a fund paid into by the working class people of Malaysia, worth billions of dollars and was being used by Joe Lowe and the Prime Minister's family to bankroll their opulent lifestyles. Okay, cool. We're pretty much back up to speed and now it's time for parties and celebrity gossip. Let's throw it back to 2009. Joe is out on the town, becoming a fixture in the club scene well known as a big spender. Tonight, he's at Avenue in New York City. And we're at the part of the story I'm going to call Joe Lowe loves spending absorbent amounts of money on gifts for models and celebrities that are completely useless. During New York Fashion Week, he bought several bottles of Cristal for models at a whopping 900 bucks a literal pop. Then he goes to One Oak in Vegas and sees Lindsay Lohan is there celebrating her 23rd birthday. So he sends her over some Cristal. 23 bottles to be exact. 
Like, is she supposed to drink all that in one sitting? Homegirl would be sauced. Oh, and it wasn't even her actual birthday. Jolo also made friends with Lohan frenemy Paris Hilton. Speaking of low-rise jeans... Joe had been obsessed with the socialite since watching her in the 2005 horror movie House of Wax. His college friends later recalled that it was his favorite movie and he would watch it on repeat. So now that Joe was in the money, he contacted Paris's manager, Joey McFarlane, and set up a deal for her to attend his parties. Her going rate was $100,000 per event. Joe Lowe also paid Kim Kardashian and Megan Fox to attend his events as well, but it seemed like he legit became real friends with Paris Hilton. He was at her 29th birthday party at the Tao nightclub in Las Vegas, where he gifted her a Cartier watch. Which again, nice, but kind of useless. I mean, just look at your phone if you need to check the time. Or better yet, stare directly into the sun. In addition to the luxury timepiece, at her birthday party, Joe Lowe also gifted Paris Hilton $250,000 worth of chips so she could gamble at the Baccarat table. Yes, the excess starts to get sickening. There is one thing I will give him credit for. Everything I've read about Joe Lowe so far, all the parties with models and celebrities, I've never come across any accounts of him being a creep. I've never heard of any incidents of him being inappropriate or making unwanted advances to the women in attendance at his parties. Most accounts I've read, folks are saying that he was just a super shy and awkward guy. He really wanted to make sure his guests were having a good time. If I do come across anything that says otherwise, I will be happy to revise my opinion that Jolo is not a Sketchosaurus. After hanging out in the clubs, he invests in some more real estate purchasing a $31 million condominium in New York City in that super cool Time Warner Center building. A condominium that was previously owned by Jay-Z and Beyonce. In addition to the old Carter family house, he bought a $17 million mansion in Beverly Hills. You know, cozy little vacation cottage. Jolo had multiple crash pads in major cities and would fly around the globe in his private jet called the Bombardier Global 5000. Whatever, I have a private jet too. Yes, technically it's just a spray hose attached to my kitchen sink that I use to wet my hair in the morning, but still, it's my own personal private water jet. And speaking of faking your way through life, next, Jolo gets into the Hollywood movie business. Around 2010, he connects his hero school buddy slash stepson of the Malaysian Prime Minister, Riza Aziz, with Paris Hilton's manager, Joey McFarland. And together, they launch Red Granite Productions. They start off producing D-list movies like Dumb and Dumber 2 and Friends with Kids. But then, they nab a big-budget prestige project a screenplay that was based on the life of notorious scammer Jordan Belfort was acquired by Leonardo DiCaprio. Leo wanted to work with Martin Scorsese, but they were having issues getting the big Hollywood studios to sign on to the project. So Leo and Marty were thrilled to team up with this indie production company with deep pockets. And thus, The Wolf of Wall Street was born. Red Granite Productions gave these guys free reign, and it shows. The Wolf of Wall Street had a $100 million production budget and no content restrictions on the project. The movie broke a record for how much profanity was set on screen. And in my personal opinion, this three-hour movie could have easily been an hour shorter. It actually was in many countries where they had to censor out the curses and graphic sexual scenes. I do think that monologue at the beginning with Matthew McConaughey was absolutely brilliant. That part is worth a rewatch, still totally holds up, and even more impressive when you find out that that whole weird chant and chest pounding was improvised by Matthew McConaughey. But everything else in that movie is junk food, fodder for making hilarious internet memes. 
But nevertheless, this super overhyped, way too long indulgent vanity project was nominated for five Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Actor. It grossed over $400 million worldwide. A movie based on rampant corruption and fraud was funded by rampant corruption and fraud. And I can't wait for the movie to come out about the making of this movie. Rewind. Four months before the production of The Wolf of Wall Street even started, the real-life Jordan Belfort, of whom this film was based on, was invited to a party at Cannes where Red Granite was to announce the launch of The Wolf of Wall Street. You guys, they spent $3 million on just the launch party. Kanye performed at it. And in the middle of Yeezy spitting flows on the mic, Jordan Belfort turned to his wife and said, This whole thing smells like a scam. It was 2011. If only others had sniffed out Joe Lowe too and put a stop to this, maybe Malaysia could have saved some of their hard-earned money. And I wouldn't have wasted my time watching the entire three hours of this completely overhyped excessive movie. And in this alternate reality, instead of The Wolf of Wall Street, there could have been a film called The Honey Badger of Bourbon Street, in which an adorable weasel eats and drinks his way through renowned New Orleans restaurants, making friends along the way with a reasonable running time of 90 minutes. <sighs> but that's not what happened. Instead, Joe Lowe gets super close to Leonardo DiCaprio. They go on gambling trips to Vegas. And Joe even gifts Leo a $3.2 million original Picasso painting. Perhaps Joe thought Leo would like the painting from Pobbs Picasso because they both like schmoozing girls half their age. Side note, I have not been able to look at Picasso's work the same again after hearing the way he describes some of his quote muses. Saying things like, for me, there are two kinds of women, goddesses and doormats. And also gems like, women are machines for suffering. Ugh, what a charmer. Dude, Pablo Picasso's own granddaughter said when it came to young women, quote, he submitted them to his animal sexuality, tamed them, bewitched them, ingested them, and crushed them into his canvas. After he had spent many nights extracting their essence, once they were bled dry, he would dispose of them. End quote. So yeah, swipe and laughed on Pobbs Picasso. Joe Lowe continued his bromance with Leo, who was a guest of honor at Joe's epic 30th birthday party in November 2012. This was known as the party to end all parties. Joe Lowe had a huge tent pitched in an abandoned lot near the Vegas Strip. And when I say huge tent, I mean it. It housed an indoor Ferris wheel. Plus, Joe had it furnished with a 24-foot bar carved out of solid ice. Again, we're in Vegas, in the middle of the desert. Props to this logistics team, man. Then Joe Lowe invited 300 of his closest friends, including Paris, Kanye, Jamie Foxx, Plus randos like Robert De Niro, Alicia Keys, Michael Phelps, Kim Kardashian, and Robin Leach. The K-pop sensation Psy performed Gangnam Style. And dozens of little people dressed up as Oompa Loompas put on a Cirque du Soleil-esque show. Britney Spears popped out of a cake and sang Happy Birthday. Just that alone cost over a mil. Chris Brown, Ludacris, and Alicia Keys' hubby, Swiss Beats, debuted their song, Everyday Birthday. Joe Lowe was gifted a couple Italian motorcycles and a Bugatti. Even though guests signed an NDA and were supposed to keep the deets of this party hush-hush, Robin Leach was granted permission to cover the story of Joe Lowe's extravagant birthday party under the condition that he keep the birthday boy's identity anonymous. Robin Leach was bowled over by this blowout, writing, quote, The celebrity list was endless. 
I have been to many jaw-dropping lifestyles of the rich and famous parties around the world over the years, but this one topped them all. And might I add, spot on Robin Leach impersonation, Angela. Bloody good show. End quote. Jolo's 30th birthday party for the rich and famous cost double digit millions. Again, all paid with stolen money. But that's not the only thing Jolo is stealing. He also stole the heart of supermodel Miranda Kerr. She was fresh off her 2013 divorce from Orlando Bloom when Joe Lowe began courting her. He showered Miranda Kerr with over $8 million worth of jewelry. And he also bought her a grand piano from the Crystal Music Company. A piano that was completely see-through. Again, let's put that in the completely useless gift for models and or celebrities column. Check. Then, for Miranda's 31st B-Day, Jolo threw her a party and hired Vanilla Ice and salt and pepper to perform. That's actually pretty cool. If anyone out there has the means and wants to throw me a party, I'll take a private performance from salt and pepper. Thanks! And speaking of dope tracks, Jolo becomes the Asian-based chairman slash advisor for the global music conglomerate EMI Music after he invested $100 million in the company. With this high-powered position the music biz, he became soups close with Alicia Keys' hubby, Swiss Beats, and former Fuji's member, Pross Michelle. Both Swiss Beats and Pross were interested in expanding their investment portfolios, so they wanted to, let's say, collaborate with Joe Lowe on some projects outside of the recording studio. More on that later. Let's stay inside the recording studio for now, because Joe Lowe teamed up with Pharrell Williams to personally record his own vanity track at Jungle City Studios in New York City. While on break, Joe Lowe bumps into Buster Rhymes and starts jokingly smack-talking him, shouting, Yo, I own you. You're my bitch. But Busta wasn't busting a gut at Joe's joke. Instead, Pharrell had to defuse the situation, and you guys, I think that maybe this is how he got the inspiration for his hit song, Happy. I picture him being like, Come on, Joe, Busta, you guys should be friends. Clap along, let's get happy. Oh my god, you guys, I am so dumb. But not dumber than the fact that Joe Lo was allowed to flourish for so long as a mega influencer without anyone asking where his money came from. He was even able to get the Obamas to pose with him for a Christmas card. The entire world was his oyster, and we were all just a bunch of shuckers. Until things finally came crashing down. Folks in Malaysia had been dubious about corruption since spotting the Prime Minister's wife, Rosa Mansour, walking around with a different Hermes Birkin bag every day. Reporters had been silenced for years. But then, the Malaysian financial newspaper The Edge was able to publish a scoop on the Prime Minister, Najib Razak. A document had leaked showing that the PM had diverted money directly from Malaysia's sovereign wealth fund 1MDB to his personal bank account. The Wall Street Journal also got word and started making the connections from the Prime Minister to Riza Aziz to Joe Lowe and began to untangle their complex web of shell companies. That's when the U.S. Department of Justice began their investigation. By 2016, this became the largest kleptocracy case in DOJ history. At least $4.5 billion was diverted from the 1MDB fund and authorities began seizing assets and arresting people close to the scandal. In 2018, Prime Minister Najib Razak lost his bid for re-election, and then he was arrested by the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission. In 2022, he was found guilty and sentenced to prison for 12 years. His stepson, Riza Aziz, he was arrested in 2019, but his hearing doesn't start until October of 2024. Riza's mother, Rosma Mansour, was also charged, convicted, and sentenced to 10 years. 
However, she's been able to stay out of prison so far due to a lengthy appeals process, further delayed by COVID, plus she recently gave birth. I'm pretty sure she's still in Singapore at the moment. But dude, when authorities raided her closet, they discovered a treasure trove. Here's a breakdown. They found 12,000 pieces of jewelry, including 2,200 rings, 1,400 necklaces, 2,100 bracelets, 2,800 pairs of earrings, 1,600 brooches, and 14 tiaras. Really, Rosma? Oh, and I'm not done. The closet raid also included 423 luxury wristwatches, including several Rolexes, 234 pairs of luxury sunglasses from brands like Versace and Cartier, and finally, 567 luxury handbags, including 272 Birkin bags from Hermes. In total, the luxury goods seized from Rosma Mansour's house were worth an estimated $250 million, all confiscated to pay restitution. So now if Rosma wants to go on a big shopping spree, she's going to need a Costco membership card. Ooh, this is fun. Let's talk about some other confiscations. Joe Lowe's super yacht, the Equanimity, was repoed, and I think Kylie Jenner bought it for her 22nd birthday, and no, I am not kidding. She renamed it Tranquility, and sailed around for a little while, then sold it, so you guys, it's back up on the market again for like 200 mil. Miranda Kerr cleverly built a room around her see-through piano, making it nearly impossible to repossess without damaging it. I think it's still sitting inside her Malibu mansion to this day. However, Miranda was subpoenaed to testify in the case against Joe Lowe, and she's been cooperating with the authorities. As well as Joe Lowe's pal, Leonardo DiCaprio, he gave back the Picasso painting and claims he had no knowledge of Joe's ties to corruption. Swizz Beats is still in a gray area. He was paid over $800,000 for his help in throwing Joe Lowe's 30th birthday bash. Plus, he was also involved in facilitating some art deals and received a commission. There are allegations that Swizz Beats and Alicia Keys still remained close and accepted monetary gifts from Joe Lowe after being warned that he was involved in a massive fraud scheme. But as of this recording, no charges have been filed against Mrs. Keys or Mr. Beats. But one celebrity sidekick was not so lucky. Former Fuji's member, Pross Michelle. He was left holding the metaphorical money bag and now has a lot of explaining to do. He's currently on trial along with some bankers from Golden Sachs. Thank God, finally! Cross claims that $20 million from Joe Lowe was given to him in exchange for Pross connecting him with the Obamas so he could take that Christmas card photo with Michelle and Barack. Pross had these connections to the Obamas because he helped arrange a donation of $865,000 from a, quote, foreign entity to Obama's 2012 re-election campaign. But the DOJ now claims this cash came from the 1MDB fund. Side note, maybe it's time we repeal the Citizens United decision and stop unlimited campaign financing, you guys. But what do I know? I'm just a dumb woman, and according to Pablo Picasso, I should stick to my role as a machine for suffering. Anyway... Pross was convicted in April 2023, but he's starting his own appeals process, claiming his attorney bungled his defense by using AI to draft his closing arguments. And no, I am not kidding. As for Joe Lowe, he is currently MIA, been on the run since 2018, currently has a successful career as an influencer slash fugitive. He's been spotted around China, at casinos in Macau, and at the Shanghai Disneyland. There are claims that the Chinese Communist Party are allowing him to live with impunity, despite being served an Interpol red notice from Malaysia, though the Chinese government denies these claims. There has also been a recent rumor that Joe Lo has a new wife. 
And he even used her ID to get a membership at the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club. Aw, how romantic. See, at least the story has a happy ending. I hope Joe Lowe gifted his new bride something truly special and not at all useless. Like a nice pair of Himalayan cashmere low-rise jeans. Uh, na 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 na, Joe Lowe, baby. Hate the game, hate the player. Secretly living for the celebrity gossip. You guys, I didn't even scratch the surface of the story. So check out the book Billion Dollar Whale by Tom Wright and Bradley Hope if you want to learn more. And if you want a better explainer about how the financials of this scheme worked, be sure to check out that phenomenal interview of Tom Wright on the Jordan Harbinger show. Ugh, I'm kind of bummed this is over. But I've been thinking a lot about how we get some restorative justice in this case, and I think I have a creative solution. Every celebrity who rubbed shoulders with Joe Lowe and benefited from his 1MDB scam should star as themselves in the big blockbuster Hollywood film adaptation of this story. And all the proceeds would go to the working people of Malaysia. What do you think? I'd shell out some dough to see that. How about you? Cool. Meet me at the Cinemagic Cinemas and we can all wear matching tiaras. Uh, sorry. Did I take it too far? I've been told I have a bad habit of trying to level jump friendships. Ugh, why do I always make social situations so awkward? Just be cool, Angela. Plus, I'm also not entirely sure where and when to wear a tiara. I must have missed that part in Rosemont Mansour's autobiography. Anyway, instead of a tiara trip to the movies, you can get in touch with me and let me know what you thought of this two-part series on Joe Lowe. You can email me directly at Angela at the truecrimefeed.com or join the True Crime Feed Facebook discussion group. Keep an open mind and be kind to fellow True Crime Feed friends. Stay tuned till after the break to hear my top three podcast power ranking of the week. Hey, True Crime Feed listeners, I have a teensy little ask of you. I need your help to grow my audience so I can keep the stories coming. So I'm asking you to take a moment and share True Crime Feed with five friends you think will enjoy the show. Like a fun, awesome pyramid scheme, but you still get to hang on to your money. Cool. And if you want extra gold stars, go to Apple Podcasts and write a review for True Crime Feed. I am an independent one woman show, and you taking a moment to do this will help me grow and compete with the big networks out there. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Now back to the show. And we're back. Here are the three shows currently trending that I think are worth a listen. I present to you this week's podcast power ranking. At the number three spot, we have witnessed fade to black. Here's a summary from the show page. When L.A. screenwriter Gary Devereaux mysteriously disappears in the summer of 1997, Weird coincidences lead family and friends to believe he may have been the victim of foul play, possibly because of his mysterious ties to the CIA. Gary was on his way home from finishing his latest script, which was allegedly going to be based in part on real events that occurred during the American invasion of Panama. And that script vanished, along with him and his vehicle. I am currently on episode four titled Show Me a Body. Dude, this one is super juicy. I just love the different directions this show goes in. Even if we don't solve Gary's disappearance, I am learning so much just from the theoretical possibilities, especially when it comes to the CIA potentially being involved. On top of that, the last five minutes of this latest episode were truly riveting. It sounds like we're in for a wild ride ahead, so buckle up for Witnessed Fade to Black. At the number two spot, we have The Wedding Scammer. Here's a rundown from the show page. Have you ever been scammed? In The Ringer's first true crime podcast, host Justin Sales tracks down a mysterious figure who once wronged him. A man with a lot of aliases a lot of failed businesses, and a trail of victims. Justin follows him through a sham media company, a series of ruined weddings and beyond, trying to find answers. The police can't offer any help, but maybe he can. 
Episode six was a super tease in the best way. You knew that wire scene was gonna happen, but that pre-gaming leading up to it was also super entertaining. Then when we finally hear from the scammer, the second I heard this guy's voice, I started to feel different about him. I'm definitely not ready to let him off the hook, but I do think there's some clear mental health issues at play here. I'll get a deeper understanding on the next and final episode where Justin interviews the accused fraudster one-on-one. So don't miss the wedding scammer. And at the number one spot, we have Ear Witness. Here's a synopsis from the show page. One July night in 1995, Deputy Sheriff William G. Hardy was shot behind the Crown Sterling Suites Hotel in Birmingham, Alabama. At the same time as the murder, at least 10 people saw to Forrest Johnson four miles away at a popular nightclub called Tease Place. But detectives zeroed in on him as a main suspect in Deputy Hardy's murder anyway, ultimately resulting into Forrest being tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. For over a quarter century, Teforis has been confined to a 5 by 8 cell on Alabama's death row. The story of Teforis Johnson and the state's enthusiasm for the death penalty in the face of such troubling evidentiary flaws brings to light the failings of a criminal justice system run amok. Yeah, this is a wild story. I saw Rebecca Lavoie from the Crime Writers On podcast give this show top marks. I'm not always in agreement with Rebecca. She's a little more highbrow prestige and my tastes are a little more, can we say, high class trash. Rebecca did not like the girlfriends and that was one of my favorites. So yeah, we can have very differing tastes. But Rebecca was 100% right about this one. Ear Witness is one of the best shows I've heard in a long time. Excellent shoe leather journalism from host Beth Shelburne mixed with dope beats. But the interviews are what makes this show so special. I feel so connected to the people involved in this story, having very intense emotional responses from literally laughing out loud to feeling deep sorrow for the victims that were crushed by this system. I'm currently halfway through the series and savoring my time with Ear Witness. Now for my miss of the week. We have the Bakersfield Three. Here's a synopsis from the show page. When two friends go missing back to back and in between their disappearances, a third friend is murdered. Their mothers begin their own investigation. As the connections between the three cases are explored, the mothers navigate devastating twists and turns, including one revelation that shakes the community to its core. Alrighty, I appreciate the earnestness of this journalist. I think she's there for the right reasons, trying to make a difference. But there is no resolution to be found here. It's just a long, painful, way too drawn out story with a bunch of loose ends. I really don't get why this is currently ranking number one right now. I liked episode one okay, but man, after listening to the stellar reporting on Ear Witness and comparing it to this show, it's like going from a delicious, light, fluffy chocolate souffle to a snack pack pudding. You know, I'll still have a few bites, but I can't get through a whole six pack. So I'm sending the Bakersfield 3 and my remaining snack pack puddings down my podcast queue trap door. Find out next week if Ear Witness will remain in the number one spot or if a new show will swoop in and take its place. Let me know what trending shows are in your top three and what show fell through your podcast queue trap door. I'll meet you back here next week to dust off another superb true crime show from the archive for your next feeding fix. That's all for today's true crime feed. Don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I post links to my top three favorite shows of the week and bring you fabulous visual aids for every episode. Be sure to follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to join the conversation, especially Instagram where I'm making those dank memes. 
And as always, if you enjoy this show, please leave a review and tell your fellow partners in crime to tune in to True Crime Feed. It's a huge help to grow the show and it means the world. So thanks for riding along and allowing me to be your audio accomplice. Join me next week for another feeding.